Okay, so <clears throat> this is chapter four, part two, uh, the protozoa and the helmets. Uh, we're starting with the protozoa. The name itself comes from Greek for first animal, uh, proto first zoa animal. Um, <clears throat> there are approximately 100,000 species uh, that have been identified so far. It's a really interesting group. It's made up of a lot of different types of organisms. Uh, one of the fun things about it is that it's kind of the junk drawer of single-celled organisms. Uh, organisms are classified as protozoa based on exclusion. In other words, it's not a fungus, it's not a helminth, it's not an animal, it's not a plant, must be a protozoa. Okay? Uh, most of them are going to be harmless inhabitants of soil and water. Okay? Uh, a few of them are actually, a few of them are some of the more harmful parasites that are out there and are responsible for millions of infections each year. Okay? Uh, so let's talk about what your typical protozoa looks like. Uh, they're single celled, all of the major eukaryotic organelles, again, minus chloroplasts, these do not photosynthesize. Some organelles uh, in some protozoans will act as primitive nervous systems to actually help these coordinate movement. Uh, a lot of them are actually very, very motile. Uh, the cell membrane uh, functions as a normal cell membrane, uh, regulating food, water, and secretions for, or I'm sorry, for all of these protozoans. Cell shape uh, can remain relatively constant. Uh, we see that in the ciliates, they sort of maintain their shape, uh, or they can be extremely fluid. The cell membrane regulates food, water, and secretions. Uh, the shape can remain relatively constant. We see this uh, in a lot of the ciliates, or be extremely fluid. This is very common in the amoebas uh, that have pseudopods or pseudopod movement. Sizes, very small, three to 300 micrometers, uh, not quite as small as bacteria or viruses, but still very small, especially for a eukaryotic organism. Uh, we do see some exceptions to this, like giant amoebas that are somewhere between three and four millimeters. Uh, that's actually quite large. One interesting thing about some protozoans is that some of them will actually have what we consider divided cytoplasm. In other words, cytoplasm externally and internally. Um, external cytoplasm is referred to as ectoplasm. Uh, it's actually outside of the cell membrane. Uh, commonly used to help in feeding and locomotion. It also protects these organisms from things like drying out. Uh, endoplasm is your typical inner cytoplasm with your nucleus, mitochondria, uh, your basic organelles will be found in there. So we've actually divided cytoplasm, ectoplasm, outer cytoplasm, endoplasm, inside. As far as nutrition goes, uh, these are heterotrophs. Okay? In other words, they feed off of other living things. Uh, most of them will be free living. Uh, the ones that are, in other words, not parasites, uh, <clears throat> scavenge dead plant or animal debris. Uh, they'll graze on bacteria or possibly algae. Honestly, anything that has nutritional value and is smaller than the protozoan is pretty much fair game for the majority of these. Uh, some species will have specialized feeding structures like oral grooves. You can see that here. Oh, I am sorry. Okay. Jumped way up there. Uh, you can see the oral groove here on this particular ciliate. Okay. Uh, if you look, it's actually sort of cupping food and helping that food be endocytosed into the organism. So having helping for food to be transferred into the cell. Okay. A lot of protozoa that do not have specialized structures will actually absorb food directly through the cell membrane. The parasites okay, that are out there uh, will live on the fluids of their host. Okay. It depends upon the parasite exactly where they live or what types of fluids they use. Um, you can find protozoans pretty much anything, anywhere. The only thing that really limits where they grow is availability of water. Okay. 
Uh, protozoans need water to survive. So <clears throat> we do also see them survive extremes of temperature and extremes of pH. Uh, a lot of protozoans do this by converting into a resistant stage called a cyst. Not all protozoans can form cysts, but the ones that do uh, seem to be a little bit more resilient and resistant to uh, things like chemicals or drying out. Okay. So two sort of uh, protozoan life cycles. Uh, trophozoite is the term we use for a motile feeding uh, protozoan. In other words, this protozoan is actively eating, actively metabolizing, and in many instances, moving. Okay. Cysts are dormant protozoans. Okay. Uh, very commonly, you'll hear that this is a dormant resting stage. The cyst form is utilized when conditions become unfavorable. So we start losing moisture, we start losing nutrients, uh, starts getting too hot, uh, too acidic, too basic. Uh, the cysts are resistant to heat, drying, and chemicals. They are also important for spreading protozoan diseases because very often cysts can be uh, dispersed through water or air currents uh, or picked up by other types of organisms. It's not uh, uncommon for people to pick up a protozoal disease uh, by somehow ingesting a cyst. So we see it here. Here's our active feeding mo modile trophozoite. Okay. Uh, eventually, okay, uh, the organism dries out, nutrients start to become scarce, and you see this organism rounds itself up okay, and starts forming a thin cyst wall. Eventually, the cyst wall thickens and matures. Okay. Uh, over time, the hope is that the environment will become favorable again. Okay. Moisture is restored, nutrients are restored, uh, the cyst wall itself breaks open, so that ruptured cyst wall uh, actually releases the trophozoite, and we have reactivation, and we're sort of back to the trophozoite stage. Okay. Now, some protozoa never enter a cyst stage. They don't have the ability, uh, so they exist only as the trophozoites. Some of them will alternate between trophozoite and cyst stages depending upon the favorability of the habitat. Okay. A couple of examples here, uh, Trichomonas vaginalis, which is actually a pretty common STD, has no cyst form. For those of you that are wondering, that's what this guy right here is. Uh, T. vaginalis is commonly passed in bodily secretions, uh, specifically sperm and vaginal secretions. Uh, there is no cyst form. It is passed as a live protozoan. Uh, just so you're aware, South Carolina has one of the highest rates of uh, Trichomonas vaginalis in the nation. Okay. Entamoeba histolytica and Giardia lambia both form cysts. Uh, most commonly, they will be found in contaminated food or water. Uh, we don't see Giardia or Entamoeba that much in the U.S. in humans. Uh, but they are actually relatively common in dogs, mainly because they will drink from any water source. Uh, the Entamoeba and Giardia in the U.S. is destroyed by wastewater treatment okay? and during any type of drinking water treatment. So those cysts actually can be gotten rid of. Uh, we see, again, these a little bit more commonly in pets. And if you're wondering... These are your Giardia trophozoites. Okay. Um, these are flagellates. Okay. You notice they have flagella to move. Okay. And these are Giardia cysts. Okay. So eventually, if conditions become favorable, this cyst will rupture and you will see these individual Giardia okay, emerge. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> All protozoans actually reproduce by simple asexual mitotic cell division, okay, or through a process called multiple fusion. Uh, you can see sexual reproduction in most protozoa. Um, ciliates actually participate in conjugation, where ciliated cells will actually join to one another. And this is a ciliate, so I'm going to put a whole bunch of cilia on there. Okay. 
So the ciliated cells will actually join to one another and exchange genetic material. Uh, the genetic material comes in the form of what is called a micronuclei. So the micronuclei gets exchanged uh, from one cell to the next. So we see sort of a new version, okay? a new combination of genes uh, based on that micronuclei exchange. Uh, this is the basics of multiple fusion. It's slightly more complicated than that, but I don't need you to know that much about protozoa and replication. So our types of protozoa. Okay? Uh, four main types. The divisions are based upon how they move. Uh, again, amoeboid protozoans, lots of times you'll see them drawn something like this. Okay? And we'll put a nice nucleus in the middle because again, these are eukaryotes. Uh, based on movement, okay, when we classify based on movement, the amoeboid protozoans all have pseudopods okay, or false feet. Okay? They move via what is known as pseudopodia. That's what each of these is. Okay? So false foot. You won't see false foot very often on a test. Instead, we'll use the correct term pseudopods. Okay? The ciliated protozoans, you guessed it, okay? they have cilia extending off of the bodies okay? of the individual protozoans. Uh, flagellates okay? move via flagella. Okay? And then the apicomplexans. Now, the apicomplexans are sessile. Okay? They're a category for the ones that do not move. Okay. Uh, lots of parasites actually fall into this category. One of the reasons for that is because these are called apicomplexans because somewhere on the organism there will be an apex uh, or a point. And at that apex, this organism will secrete a complex that actually helps it digest its way into other cell types. Okay. Great example of this is malaria. Uh, malaria, <coughs> malaria protozoans are apicomplexans and they will eventually sort of digest their way into liver cells and or blood cells uh, and once in the liver cells or once in the blood cells the blood cells will carry these organisms where they want to go, provide them with food, provide them with nutrients. So the apicomplexans are carried by their host cells and don't actually need to be able to move to an environment where there are certain types of foods and certain types of water or other nutrients. Those will be provided by the cell they've inhabited. So a couple of examples, okay. uh, trypanosomiasis, a lot more commonly known as African sleeping sickness. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this comes in two forms, uh, trypanosoma brucei gambians, uh, commonly called West African sleeping sickness. We see this in about 95% of all cases. Uh, Trypanosoma brucei rhodesians, okay, uh, which is found in East and Southern Africa, it's known as East African sleeping sickness. Um, both of these okay, are caused by the trypanosome version of protozoa. Okay. Uh, if left untreated, the disease becomes fatal. Okay. This is what we consider a vector-borne disease. In other words, this is commonly used to describe diseases that are passed by insects. Okay, so the vector is an insect. Uh, specifically, the vector in African sleeping sickness uh, is the tsetse fly. And that would be this guy right here. This is a biting fly about the size of a horse fly. Um, in other words, larger than a normal house fly. Most of the damage that we see comes from these particular trypanosomes, one thing that you'll notice if you actually look at pictures of these is that they will usually start attacking blood cells. Okay? Uh, once inside the blood cell, you can see rupture of the blood cells. 
lots of what we term indirect host damage. Uh, in other words, the symptoms are caused by your immune system responding to the organisms. So we see oftentimes excessive amounts of inflammation, uh, mainly because the immune system can't control the growth of the trypanosome. Uh, infections start at the bite site okay, and eventually make their way commonly into the blood. Okay. The real danger and fatality comes when the organism crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, what you see after that is meningoencephalitis or infl inflammation of the meninges in the brain. Uh, that meningoencephalitis is eventually fatal. Uh, you can see progression here okay. uh, from the blood to the lymphatic system to the central nervous system. Uh, we start with the canker, which is basically a sore where the bite was, uh, intermediate fever, maybe some headache as it moves into the lymphatic system. Uh, the fever continues. Uh, usually, this is what we consider febrile episodes, so you sort of ebb and flow between fevers and chills. Okay. Uh, lymphadenopathy deterioration of health uh, as this progresses to the central nervous system we see a lot more neurological symptoms uh, anorexia uh, minor neurological symptoms to start with then we begin to see severe sleep disturbances um, the neurological symptoms continue to get worse uh, coma convulsions uh, and eventual death right? this is if left untreated and the Gambians and if you remember, that was the West African sleeping sickness with the bulk of the cases. Okay. This progression is from months to years. Okay. So you have much more time to get treated. Uh, the Rhodesians, if you recall, under 5% of reported cases. Okay. Uh, the progression is in weeks to months. So this is a very serious progression. Uh, if you can call it that, luckily the Gambians is the most prevalent version, okay? And we actually see a little bit less mortality in the Gambians than we do in the Rhodesians. Right. Now, <clears throat> just when you thought you were off the hook, there is a version of American sleeping sickness. Uh, it is also technically a trypanosome uh, so you could call it American trypanosomiasis. Uh, it is actually much more commonly referred to as Chagas disease. Okay? And this one has a completely different vector uh, and a completely different organism that is causing it. While I'm on the subject, okay, causative organism okay, or causative agent. Okay? This is a thing that actually causes you to be sick. The technical term for this is the etiology. Okay. The etiology of disease. Okay. The etiology here is a trypanosome called Trypanosoma cruzi. Okay. And it is also vector borne, okay. but the vector is not a fly, it is instead something called a triatamine bug, also known as a kissing beetle. Okay. You can see them here and here. Uh, <clears throat> infection uh, actually begins when people are bitten by the triatamine bug and at the site okay, of the bite transfers the trypanosoma cruzi into the person. Uh, one of the reasons they are called kissing bugs is that very often people will awaken to find them near their mouths. Uh, this is usually, again, in Central and South American countries, and they'll bite somewhere near the mouth. Uh, usually some of the first symptoms we see begin inflammation upwards from the bite site, so inflammation of the eye. You can see that here. Okay. Um, so immediate acute stages. Uh, honestly, most people see no immediate reaction. What we do see, swelling of the eye, tenderness, fever, uh, this can be extremely dangerous in people that are young or immunocompromised. Uh, eight to ten weeks after the infection, there's usually no symptoms. Most danger comes in 
in what we consider chronic infections. Okay? Chronic infections do not occur in all of the population. Uh, realistically, we see them in somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of those that are infected. Okay? And so 20, 10 to 20 years later, the most dangerous one is the enlarged heart. Okay? Where the trypanosome actually makes its way to the heart. Um, the danger here is heart failure. Okay? Uh, once it becomes this severe, you're looking for a heart transplant to be sort of your next option. Uh, we have very few therapies against this. That's very common when it comes to protozoa and other eukaryotic organisms that we're trying to get rid of, uh, mainly because they're eukaryotes like we are, so their cells are very similar to ours. So a lot of the drugs we use are toxic to those uh, organismal cells and in the same instance they are toxic to our cells so we see high toxicity and low cure rate among the few types of drugs that we have okay. in this instance you would be using an anti-protozoal okay. and you cannot get away from the protozoans without talking about malaria okay. Uh, malaria is caused by a parasite called plasmodium. Okay, the plasmodium protozoan, there are several versions of this. Uh, plasmodium malariae, plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium ovale, plasmodium knolls, okay, uh, plasmodium vivax, I believe that's all five versions, uh, all of which cause malaria, uh, some more severe symptoms than others. Uh, so what we see. Uh, malarial sperm actually fertilizes an egg inside of the gut of a mosquito, okay? and a sporozoite is born in the mosquito. When the mosquito bites its victim, it passes the sporozoite, which is basically sort of a juvenile version of a protozoan, uh, from the mosquito to the human. Okay? Once the sporozoite is in the human's bloodstream. It actually ends up making its way to the liver. It's very easy to do. All blood will eventually reach the liver. Um, it will penetrate liver cells and begin reproducing, basically filling the liver cells to capacity, and eventually the liver cells begin to rupture. Okay? Those sporozoites are now released out into the blood okay, from the liver. Uh, where they attach themselves to blood cells. Remember, these are apicomplexins, so they will actually end up finding their way into the blood cells. Okay. And as time goes on, okay. uh, actually, I'm over here in the blood. This is the liver cell. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. And as time goes on, uh, they eventually cause the blood cells to rupture. Okay. This depletes the body of oxygen. Okay. And we all know that oxygen is extremely important because limited amounts of oxygen mean that you can make limited amounts of ATP. ATP is what keeps cells functioning. So without that functional ATP, cells begin to slow down and not be able to do their jobs. Okay. We saw that in the African sleeping sickness, blood cells being affected. And when the blood cells are affected, just like in malaria, we see things like lethargy, malaise, uh, sort of general unwellness because we cannot keep up with the demands of an entire organism or entire cells without ATP. So, moving on. Let's talk about the helmets. Oops. Sorry for the noise. Okay. Uh, these will include tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms. Um, the adults are usually large enough to be seen with the naked eye, which lots of times begs the question, why are these included with the microorganisms? Uh, most of the time, they are not transmitted as adults. They are transmitted as eggs or larvae, both of which will be microscopic. Okay. Uh, most of these, honestly, are not parasites. Again, free living inhabitants of the soil and water. Okay. Those that are parasites will spend at least a portion of their life cycles in the gastrointestinal tract, even if they're passing through the GI tract to get to another desired home. Um, 
some of them will set up shop in the GI tract and stay there for the duration. Okay? We know of about 50 species of helminths that parasitize humans. You can find them all over the world, with the highest incidence being in tropical areas. Uh, the yearly estimate of cases is somewhere in the billions, and this is by no means confined to developing countries. Okay? Uh, we have a conservative estimate of about 50 million helminthic infections in North America alone. And if you don't know, that's us, the U.S. and Canada. So this is not a problem that other places have. We are absolutely included in the helminthic infections. Okay. So, two major varieties when you start breaking it down of helminths. Uh, flatworms, okay. uh, called so because they often have a long, thin, segmented body. Lots of times they're also known as tapeworms. Okay. Or sometimes you'll hear people call them ribbon worms and flukes. Okay. And we also see round worms. They are the opposite of the flatworms uh, with these sort of cylindrical, elongated bodies. Okay. They are oftentimes also referred to as nematodes. So you can see it here. This is an example of a flatworm and that segmented body we were talking about. Uh, look at the bar here. This is a centimeter bar. Uh, that means this thing is a good 10 inches. Roundabout. Uh, the advantage to being flat, right, the advantage of these guys being a flatworm, is that it gives them more surface area through which to absorb nutrients. These aren't going to have mouths and bring food in. Instead, what they're going to do is absorb nutrients uh, from the outside of the body across the skin, which is all referred to here as a cuticle. Okay? Uh, you will also see suckers on the head or scolex okay, that at help attach the flatworm to its host. Okay. Uh, another example of the flatworms, the flukes, that's what these are down here. Okay. Right. So here you can see the fluke again. This is a millimeter bar this time. Uh, this one is probably the size of a cross your pinky. Okay? You can see it with the naked eye, but it's going to be very small. Okay? Notice okay, uh, all of the internal structures here. Remember, this is a large multicellular organism. Okay? An oral sucker and a ventral sucker, both for attachment. Um, an esophagus and a pharynx. Notice the vast deferens of ovaries and uterus and the testes. Uh, in other words, this organism is hermaphroditic. The roundworm, okay, the roundworms usually have separate sexes and a relatively developed reproductive tract. Uh, GI tract in there, uh, you'll see brain and nerves. Uh, these seem to be much more developed than the flatworms. The females usually a good bit larger than the males uh, because they will lay large numbers of eggs. Uh, again, these are multicellular, equipped with organs and organ systems, with the most developed being the reproductive tract. Uh, complete life cycle for these guys, fertilized egg, larval stage, and an adult stage. Okay. Uh, adults will derive nutrients and reproduce sexually within their host. Okay. Now... <clears throat> For helminths to sustain themselves as a species, they transmit an infective form, this is usually an egg or larvae, to the body of another host. They cannot maintain large numbers of helminths in one host. There's not enough food to go around. Okay. So for the helminthic life cycle, we often divide hosts into two categories. Uh, the host in which the larva develops is called an intermediate host. Okay and adulthood and mating occur in the definitive host. Okay? This is your key term, mating. Okay? Anytime you see mating occurring, uh, that should automatically tell you that is a definitive host. Okay? Sources for humans, contaminated food, uh, water, or soil. Okay? 
Mostly we see oral intake, people drinking contaminated water, eating contaminated food, or even sometimes inhaling eggs. Uh, it is also possible for us to see penetration uh, of unbroken skin. These would come in the cat class of vector-borne helminths. There are some out there where the larvae or egg are passed in insects. So being bitten actually passes uh, the larvae. Okay. So an example here. Okay. This is something known as river blindness. Uh, it's caused by a helmet called onchocerca. Uh, the actual term for the disease is onchocerciasis. Okay. And we are going to start over here down at the bottom. Okay. I'm going to start down at the bottom with the fly. Okay. So let's start with sort of how the fly got sick. Okay. So, the black fly feeds on the blood of someone that is infected and picks up these little larvae that are called microfilariae. Okay. The microfilariae actually begin to, to develop into infectious larvae. Okay. Uh, eventually, the infected black fly takes a meal from a host okay, and it deposits larvae onto the skin while it's biting and the larvae enter the wound. Okay. Now, once inside uh, the skin, the larvae develop into worms, which end up clustered together into dense nodules. As you can see the nodule here. Uh, adult worms actually mate and reproduce. Okay? So they mate and produce microfilarae. Um, a female worm can produce about a thousand microfilarae a day. That is a lot of worms. Notice that word here, mate. Okay? So what kind of host are we talking about? Over here, the human, that word mate automatically makes you the definitive host. Okay? That means the fly, okay, where the microfilarae develop, is the intermediate host. Okay? So mating in the definitive host, uh, <coughs> development in the intermediate host. So, for those that do not get dispersed as larvae, uh, a lot of the helmets will develop and uh, release fertilized eggs out into their environment. Uh, they're provided with a protective shell and extra food to promote growth of the larvae. Okay. They are vulnerable to heat and cold and predators, in other words, they can be killed. Okay in order to make sure that some of these organisms survive okay, and successfully complete their life cycles, certain helmets will lay anywhere from 200,000 to 25 million eggs a day just to make sure that some of those eggs make it to a new host. Okay? So we're spending a lot of time on reproduction here. Okay? So. A few examples, you can see them in table four or five. Okay. Uh, they're divided, round worms versus flat worms. Okay. Uh, I am going to pick sort of a select few of these. Okay. I'm going to talk about the one that is probably the most common in the U.S., and that would be the pinworm. Okay. Pinworms or seat worms are caused by the roundworm Enterobius vermicularis. Um, it's a relatively common infestation of the large intestine, especially when it comes to younger children. The worms themselves can be anywhere from 2 to 12 centimeters long. Okay? And they're roundworms, so they have that nice sort of cylindrical shape to them. Uh, so how does this happen? How do you get pinworms? The life cycle. Microscopic eggs get swallowed. Okay. They are handled, picked up from another infected person or an infected object. Um, basically, the eggs are extremely sticky, so they stick to hands, stick to toys. Um, the eggs hatch in the intestines. Okay. Larvae become adults within about a month, and then male and female worms begin to mate. Uh, mating in the human host makes the host a definitive host. Okay. Uh, Females actually migrate to the anus and deposit eggs outside 
of the anus uh, in the perianal region. Usually this ends up causing intense itching because again those eggs are nice and sticky and scratching causes the eggs to be stuck to fingers okay? and that allows for the eggs to spread to toys, door handles, and other children. So we see this sort of cycling back okay, to the beginning. <clears throat> Obviously this is common in kids because they do not wash their hands well and they have very difficult time controlling themselves when it comes to not scratching something that itches. Okay? Uh, in this instance, there is one host. Okay? It's human to human transmission. Uh, no intermediate host, therefore the human is the definitive host, everything happens there. The last example, uh, elephantiasis, caused by a roundworm again, called Wuchereria bancrofti. Okay. Here, okay, uh, this one is vector-borne, passed by a mosquito that releases microfilarae uh, into the bloodstream. Eventually they make their way to the lymphatic system. Okay. And the larvae actually migrate to the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic ducts. Okay? Uh, as these grow and mature, they actually end up blocking off the lymphatic ducts. If you remember, those inguinal ducts are right there in the groin area. Um, your lymphatic system's job is to remove excess fluid, okay? to move especially lymph. Okay? What we see is that that fluid gets stuck in the lower extremities. Uh, so we see uh, gross distension of the legs. Okay? In males, you will also see distended testes. Okay? Uh, very, very common. This is treatable. There are anti-helminthics out there. We don't see this a lot in the U.S. It's actually a lot more common in areas with poor access to medical care. Again, this is because those organisms are actually accumulating in those lymphatic ducts, preventing that lymphatic fluid from leaving the body, or from leaving certain areas of the body more specifically.